Maureen's joining us from Wyoming Liberty Group, and boy, Maureen, we have people hopping mad already over this topic, and I got to what we're going to talk about in sort of a roundabout way uh, with some articles from some other states, which leads right into the articles that you have right now posted on my website. It's Thursday. Therefore, on Thursdays, we always talk to Wyoming Liberty Group, and Maureen joining us from their library right now. So, okay. Let's clear the air here, Maureen. What is this outrageously stupid bill that they're actually suggesting? Well, there are actually two bills. You know, what's happening right now is that all the committees are getting together, and so bills are actually coming out of the le these legislative committees fast and furious, and the Joint Labor, Health, Social Services Interim Committee is no slacker. Among others, they've got two bills, and those are the ones we're going to talk about today. One is called Hospital Licensure, which is a bit of a misnomer because essentially what it would do is for hospitals deemed to be discriminating against Medicare and Medicaid patients and choosing to serve patients who pay with their own money or pay patients with private insurance, they would take away their license to operate. Okay, so now you could imagine off, the name of the committee to me right away sounds Orwellian as, as, soon, as, as soon as I hear it. And then I stopped to take a look at the gentleman. I was wondering who wrote the bill in the first place, and you sent me uh, his name, which I went ahead and looked him up, and it was pointed out by a friend of mine. Apparently, he graduated from Harvard, so no big surprise here, Maureen. <laughs> He's actually a very smart fellow. It's just unfortunate yeah, yeah. that sometimes it, when it comes to these social issues, he gets a little bit waylaid by special interest groups, and we can talk about that in a little bit as well. He's socialist on the social issues. Gotcha. So there's another bill as well that also is very Orwellian, and that one is called the Hospital Charity Care Equalization Act. Yeah. Essentially what that one would do is tax hospitals who would dare to treat patients who want to pay with their own money or who want to use their private insurance for, for these things. Now essentially these two bills, and as you just mentioned, we know we've got some special interest group lobbying that are lobbying these senators and lobbying these legislators. What these two bills are designed to do is shut down physician-owned hospitals in the state. Okay, now before we get into this anymore, and, and by the way, part of what we were talking about last hour is people being able to save their own money through healthcare savings accounts, mm -hmm. Or even if you want, which of course has to be regulated and taxed, you're only allowed to put six thousand dollars in there. That was that was part of what we were talking about. But it seems that every single turn, whenever you want to spend your own money on your own health care, there's people out there who just want to put a stop to it. Now I don't understand why. Is there a reason why they want to put a stop to it? Well, because they want the government to control everything. They want it to be like in Canada. We can get a little into that a little bit later because I've got some examples of the direction that we're moving in. Mm -hmm. Because you know, it's it's very similar to what you have in Canada. And the the problem is that a lot of Americans believe that the Canadian system is some sort of utopia where everybody gets all the health care they could possibly need. But what they're forgetting is that resources in an economy are limited. You have only so many doctors, you only have so many hospitals, you only have so many band-aids. Once those things are used up, then you don't have any more. Now, and, and it really and doesn't matter what the government promises you, that's a, that, that sense of security is just an illusion. And let's have some full disclosure here for people who might immediately criticize what you just said. Hey, Maureen, where are you from? I'm from Canada. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So <laughs> I just wanted to get that out because right away when I talk about Canada, people tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. Maureen knows what she's talking about. She's from yeah. Canada. So, okay. Full, full disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's start with the, the, the first one because out of the two articles that you sent me, the first one that you just mentioned, really, I mean, I'm surprised there's not gray matter on the walls here. What, why, what again, again, was that sponsored and any chance of it even getting out of committee? Well, yes. In fact, it's pretty likely that the Charity Care Equalization Bill will get out of committee. And, and that one is just as problematic, if not more so, than the hospital licensure or de-licensure bill, well, bill, because essentially it would tax every hospital in the state. Okay, see, I don't want to interrupt. I just want to make sure everybody understands, again, the Orwellian names. What was the name of that first bill again? Hospital licensure. No, no, the other one. Hospital Charity Care Equalization. Which does none of the above. Which does none of the above. All it does is tax hospitals that make money and give hospitals that aren't managed very well. Okay, so let's 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 start with that one. Can we dig into it a little bit so people understand exactly what's in the bill? 
Well, with the hospital licensure bill, uh, uh, licensure bill, essentially what will happen is that if a, if a hospital is it's, it's pretty short and simple. If a hospital is deemed to be discriminating in some way against Medicare or Medicaid patients, then they will lose their license to operate. Now, with a, it's, this is actually quite tricky because with Obamacare, physician-owned hospitals, new physician-owned hospitals, are not permitted to serve Medicare and Medicaid patients. So essentially what you can see is happening here is that this is closing the door to new physician-owned hospitals or new for-profit hospitals in, in, the, in the state. And what that will potentially do, of course, is reduce choice for people. So you're, you're not going to be able to choose to go to a new hospital because a new private hospital or a new physician-owned hospital or a new specialty hospital because there won't be any. And then what will happen, you know, is that doctors will say, well, gee, you know, I'm getting really tired of working within the county hospital system that's poorly managed, very high infection rates, they've got all these other kinds of problems. I want to be able to do what I want to do. I can't do it here in Wyoming. I'm going to go to another state to do it. Or I'm going to, instead of serving patients, I'm going to play golf. So what it means for people is that you're going to have less access to physicians. And we already have a problem with access to physicians here in this state. It's a small rural state. It's very difficult to find new physicians. In fact, I spoke to the Dr. Bush here in, uh, in, the, sta in the state uh, Department of um, Health, and he was saying that the real problem here in, in the state already for Medicaid and Medicare patients is that we just don't have enough providers. With the federal government reducing reimbursements, it's going to make it even more difficult. And and I'm not just making this this up from, from like from out of my imagination, because again, if we go back to the Canadian system, what we can see is that if you go to a rural area, about 30% of doctors in rural areas take new patients. In, it's even worse in urban areas, it's less than 20% of doctors will take new patients. And I've experienced that myself when I moved to a place called Prince Rupert, which is in northern British Columbia, which is just south of the southmost point of the Alaska Panhandle. I had to, to, to see a, a doctor about something quite specific. I couldn't get one. They, keep, they kept on telling me, look, we're not taking new patients. We're not taking new patients. And finally, I just said, hey, you know what? I'm actually really healthy. I just need this one thing. I promise I'm not going to come in very often, and I won't be a, a problem. They said, oh, oh, well, okay. And then they took me, you know? Oh, well, so now, that, that's the sort of thing. Well, I, I just wanted to point out, we've talked about this before, that if you do go see a physician and you choose to pay in cash, it's, it's a much less expensive way to go. And I've talked with some doctor friends of mine that Wyoming could be a vacation spot for another reason that a lot of these people haven't thought of before, and that would be taking a medical vacation. We could set ourselves up that way. In fact, the Wyoming Liberty Group has got a big paper, Medical Freedom Zones, that our, two, that our um, legal team has done. Steve Klein, maybe you can come back and talk about that again another time here on the show. But that's very true. You know, We have this opportunity. And in fact, there was a really good article that was talking about a physician-owned uh, surgical center in Oklahoma. Essentially, what he was doing is posting his prices online, and he he was getting all kinds of patients, first from Canada, because again, this goes back to what happens when you've got a paternalistic socialized system where the government is going to pay for everything, that you suddenly can't get what we call timely care. So you go on a waiting list because if we go back to this idea that resources are limited. There's a rationing system going on. If you have a condition that's considered elective, that means that you go on a waiting list. And if you have a hernia, for example, I had a friend who waited for over a year for a hernia operation. I don't know if you know what a hernia is like, but apparently, and I've never had one either, but apparently it's very painful. So imagine, and it's very painful and actually can be life-threatening depending on on what happens when you have this hernia. You know, it should, it's something that should get treated right away. But he had to wait a whole year. I mean, you can die from this. And this is one of the things that happens in Canada that people here in the States sometimes don't realize, is that people die on these waiting lists. At the very least, your condition is going to get much worse if you have to wait at least a year. But there is the potential to actually die while you're on these waiting lists. Well, and uh, we need to head into a break real quick here, but let me ask you before we do. So, again, it, both of these bills, I'm just give, give me a percentage if possible. I know you're guessing a little bit, but uh, these bills actually getting out of committee and getting onto the floor. 
I think the, from what I understand from my contact on the committee, the licensure bill is very unlikely to come out, but the charity care equalization is probably very likely because there's a lot of misunderstandings about the, this notion of charity care, about private for-profit hospitals, how much charity care they actually do, and then you compare it to some of these so-called non-profit hospitals, how many how much charity care they actually do and in fact there was a, a study done by the GAO and it showed that a lot of these private for-profit hospitals in fact engage in more charity care than these non-profit hospitals so this is something that the legislature really has got to take a close look at is shutting down competition really the way to ensure that we've got charity care and and access to care here in this state or are we going to try to assuage these special interest groups who are working in their own special interests? All right, we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment with Maureen from Wyoming Liberty Group. And back in we dive with Maureen from Wyoming Liberty Group as we're talking about a couple of pieces of legislation, which, by the way, Maureen, I think I'll keep that up for a little while longer because I thought those were very good, very informative articles. People need to know that these are in committee right now, and both of them have to do with your health care. And, 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 oh, by the way, it's a little while before they actually get into session, so for people who want to call their local representatives, now would be the time to do it and read about the legislation. Could you explain to people uh, what the process is when these bills go through? Because most people don't understand the committee process. Well, sometimes it is a bit of a mystery. Essentially what happens is that, that a bill will be suggested by either a, a committee member, in the committee, in the committee process anyhow, or, in, or a legislator during the session or before the session, and they sort of list all these out on the Legislative Service Office website. Uh, other times what happens is the bureaucracies like the Game and Fish Department will come up and say, look, you know, we need more money. Uh, here's a bill with our fee increases, which in fact did go through this time, the travel committee, so that's going to be another big battle coming up in the budget session. Or you have the situation like we have here where you've got a special interest group like the Wyoming Medical Center that wants to prevent competition in its area. It goes to a legislator or someone on the committee and says, you know, we really need to prevent these physician-owned hospitals from being constructed, I need you to put forward a committee bill. Because the thing with committee bills is that during a budget session, a committee bill only needs 50% to pass, but a bill that's brought forward by a, just a regular legislator needs a 65% majority to pass. So this is, this is the, the danger of having these legislative uh, bills, these committee bills go through. So what people can actually do now is try to stop these bills from getting out of committee. You don't need to wait and call your own legislator, although that, that certainly does help. You can also testify in front of these committees. Now, these, these two bills are going to be discussed for the first time on November 4th and 5th in Lander. So if you happen to be in Lander or if you're listening, or if you want to provide testimony, written testimony, you can also do that. We've got a doctor providing some testimony to the to the legislative committee, and he's telling them, you know, look, this is very anti-competitive. It's going to make it more difficult for me, and you know, I'm thinking about leaving leaving healthcare. So that's that's also an option. And and uh, I've sent some information to you, Glenn, that you can post up on your website. Or if people want to know, they can go to the whyliberty.org site, and or they can give us a call, 307-632-7020, if you want more information about how you can actually either testify or provide your written comments if you're concerned about this. But you take a look at the bill, you read through it, you look at what the possible consequences are, and you, and you can send your comments into the committee. Because believe me, those special interest groups are going to be there, they're going to be pushing for this, and if the committees don't hear anything from you, they're going to say, well, you know, nobody really cares about this. I guess we might as well just go through with it. That, that's, that's a big problem throughout, the, throughout this pre-session where we've got all the, the interim committees meeting talking about these bills, and it will also be a problem during the session because, of course, and that's the problem, right? You've got these special interest groups. They've got a, they're small. They're very focused. They want something, and the, peop the people that they're hurting, the regular taxpayers, are it, it's just everybody. And so what it's going to cost you as a regular taxpayer it doesn't really make it worth it for you to make a trip to Cheyenne or a trip to Lander uh, to make your views known. And that's how these really bad bills go through. And then, you know, you find yourself saying one day, oh, 
geez, how did the situation get so bad? You know, for instance, oh, gee, how did we get end up with this Obamacare? Well, it's because you had very focused special interest groups who really wanted to have this socialist health care system, and then the and the insurance companies who really thought this was going to be a good deal for them until, of course, it wasn't. And that's how these things happen, you know. And so it's really important for people to to speak out. And you do have an opportunity to stop these two bills in Lander on November fourth and fifth. Okay, and I, you know, I'm going to pass this video along to some people that I know will show up, and and, and doctors included. Mm -hmm. That will actually make the trip to go all the way down there because it is the people who show up who actually, you know, if if you don't show up like you just said, I, I've been preaching that for years now. If you don't show up, take a look at what happens. So okay, mm -hmm. uh, besides them, well, let, let me step back for a minute. Let's take a look at anti-competitive uh, in the state of Wyoming. I was blown away that this thing would ever be suggested in the first place, because despite all the liberalism in the state, it's still a very conservative state. Mm -hmm. Isn't the was it a, a senator or is it a, a representative that introduced this bill? The senator. Senator, okay. And I looked at him and I thought, there's an R by his name. How is he doing something that is uh, anti-competitive, anti-capitalist, and isn't the whole point of reducing health care? And what I was reading last year, the whole point of the, or last hour, the whole point of the Obamacare exchange, so they say, is to bring competition into the system because that lowers prices. So apparently those people who are pushing this bill don't see that there's an opportunity here to lower prices and for that matter keep some doctors in the state because doctors will come to a state where they can actually make a profit and keep it. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. We see this over and over again. And again, it goes back to this idea of, or this reality that you've got these very focused special interest groups and they are continuously at these legislators and legislators may not hear another side because remember what happened in the last session we had legislators looking at it was over 400 close to 500 bills obviously every single legislat legislator is not going to have the time to study in detail or even maybe read all of the bills so they're going to be voting depending on what the people they trust are doing and sometimes the people they trust have got bad information or they don't have, obviously in this particular case, they don't have the whole story. So they might not be seeing both sides of the issue. And that's why it's important for people to keep an eye on what is happening with these bills and speaking out when they see things like this, these two kinds of bills that will effectively close down the, the construction of new physician-owned hospitals in the state. And, and remember that people in Wyoming just last last election, election in 2012, voted 77 percent yes on health care freedom. There was a health care freedom amendment, the ability to pay uh, for a patient to pay and the ability for a doctor to receive payment for uh, a procedure is protected and it's true that the legislature has the responsibility to make sure that things happen smoothly or things aren't abused, but the thing is they in fact are abusing the system themselves if they're using legislation to shut down the construction of new hospitals because that will effectively limit choice here in the state. Well now, see, I right away worry that, of course, you know, you always get the, the camel's nose in the door. If they can do this to a hospital, then they can start doing this to private physicians in their own personal private practice. That would, to me, be the next logical step, wouldn't you think? Well, and it is, because in Canada, for instance, there have been lawsuits brought against doctors who have refused to do things like sex change operations. So, so now the doctor is essentially forced to perform an operation that he feels is immoral, is wrong. This is where a socialist healthcare system takes you. So people have really got to wake up to this, and they've got to stand up, they've got to get active in these committees, and they've got to prevent these sorts of things from happening, because you, believe me, you're going, this is a death spiral, and this is the direction that the country is going in. Believe me, you don't want to go there. Well, is there any possibility, and this is where I'm asking for, I don't know, may, may, maybe it's outside of your bounds, but legal expertise on something like this. If something like this were to actually pass, is it possible for doctors or people who want to put these hospitals together in Wyoming to step up and sue? Yes, it is possible. We've taken a look at this, but what we would need what we would need are the actual doctors who want to in fact build the hospital. They're sort of the I forget the exact legal term, but they're the ones who would need to bring the case. A group like Wyoming Liberty Group for instance could come in as a friend of the court. So it is possible for doctors to sue in this particular case, but we don't actually need to let it get this far. 
and again, it's important. But again, it would be important for the doctors who are interested in building this new hospital in Casper, the one that the Wyoming Medical Center is in fact lobbying for these two bills to shut down. It's important for them to step forward, say who they are, say they want to bring a suit, and we'd be we'd be more than happy to help them with that. And, you know, the funny thing about the Wyoming Medical Center is that they've lobbied for years in different in, on different issues to try to prevent competition in the market. And the problem with them, apparently, is that they are very, very poorly managed. They had a big, big problem with the neurosurgeons at the hospital. The neurosurgeons had sued them. The neurosurgeons, I think, essentially didn't have much luck with the courts. So they decided to set up their own hospital. That's the Mountain View Mountain View Regional Hospital, mm -hmm. which is a, which is especially neurosurgeon spinal kind of place. And what happened then was that the Wyoming Medical Center lost lost its sole provider um, the name exactly sole provider status. And that's eight million dollars every year that they lost. Oh no, you're still going. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I'm just up against a hard break, but. Okay. Uh, we have more that we have to talk about with this, so I'm going to go ahead and, and send you a message that maybe Monday we can talk about this and a little bit more because I got some doctors I got to talk to that want to come down and okay. attend that meeting that you were just talking about. We got to get we got to get some people together on this. I got to run. Hard break coming up. Thank, Thank you, you, Maureen. Thank you. Bye now.